Thank you. But yeah, so, so thank you for coming. Um, so, yeah, I'm Dan Lockton. Um, I work at Carnegie Mellon, and I'm going to talk to you about design and the importance of imaginaries. Um, you can probably hear from my accent that I'm not from Pittsburgh. Um, you know, eventually I'm sure I'll get there. But, um, yeah, so I'm, I moved to Pittsburgh a couple of years ago from, from London. I used to work at the, at the Royal College of Art, as, um, as, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and at, at Carnegie Mellon, I started this thing called the Imaginaries Lab, which is, is a, you know, it's not really a lab yet, but it's a kind of emerging thing. It's, it's basically a group, of, a group of us, a group of grad students and um, undergrads and a dog. Um, and we're looking, at, we're looking at kind of, um, at, we're looking at questions. I suppose what we, what we do is kind of look at, sorry, um, kind of questions like, how do people understand local government? Or... If you could hear electricity, would that change how you understand it? Would you understand it differently? Or um, can you use model landscapes to explore how you think about your own life? Or could we even create new metaphors to help us kind of understand complex ideas differently? And so what all those are related to is they're kind of using design as a way of, um, of understanding how people understand. If that, if that makes sense, or helping people understand things in new ways. And really, it's not just using design. It's really using design methods. So it's using the sort of the ways that designers who are working on products or services or, or designing software um, might use to do research with people. But it's applying them in, in other ways. It's applying them to try to find out things about society, about how people think, about, you know, about kind of other issues. And it's also using the methods to help people imagine new ways of living as well. Like, how could things be different? Um, so what are imaginaries? I mean, it's a, you know, it's a term that is, is, um, is really from sociology. And what it kind of refers to is, is the, sort of the, the ways that we as a society, the different ways that we imagine particular concepts that are often quite intangible or difficult to put a finger on. So, so if I asked you to, to close your eyes now, Right, just um, and I will probably forget to ask you to open them again. So you know, be be you know, take some initiative. Um, close your eyes for a second, and and think about what what do you imagine when I say to you like America? What is your imaginary of America? Like, do you visualize something? Is it are you seeing images of things? Is it I don't know I don't know what they might be. Is it a flag? Is it a Statue of Liberty? Is it groups of people? Is it cities? Is it countryside? Is it like deserts? Is it kind of you know, is it the coast? I don't know, it could, be, it could be lots of things to different people. It might be something quite amorphous. It might be Washington, D.C. It might be a president, a president, um, not necessarily the president. It might be, you know, it might be a number of different, a number of different things. Now, obviously, there's no right or wrong answer, but the way that, the thing that comes to mind reflects some degree of kind of social conception that has been, you know, that, is, that, is, that, is, that in some way probably affects how you act or how you approach things. You know, who are the people in your vision? Are they like you? Are they, you know, are they from the same background as you? Are they people completely different? Like, do you are you part of that imaginary, or is it something else? Okay, so so apart from so we we looked at America there, but and obviously there's no right or wrong answer. This is just using it as an example. What about something like artificial intelligence? Like, what comes to mind with that? You know, if if you were going by the sorts of images that are used in like most news stories, what comes to mind with artificial intel artificial intelligence? The imaginary is probably some sort of I don't know, Android robot, it's probably silver, it's got blue LEDs all over it or something, you know, with this sort of vacant expression. Now, the extent to which those kinds of visions affect the way that, that we approach these subjects, like, it's important, right? It has effects. Um, you know, there are lots of different ways that could be imagined, but the, but the sort of societal imaginaries or the mental models or the mental images that we, that we have end up affecting the way we approach ideas. They affect whether we're positive or negative towards them in very simple terms, but they also affect probably how we think about whether we're part of it, are we included, what is the default, you know, what are, what are the ways we, we think about things. And I think some of this touches a bit on, on some of the things that, that Savika said, said just now, in fact, in, in terms of kind of noticing the negative space or noticing things that are not present in your imagined ideas and, you know, perhaps questioning, well, why are they not there? Or, you know, should they be there or could they be there? So I don't want to go into, into too much detail of the background of it from a sociology point of view, but there's this basic idea, which is, I mean, this is from the 1920s, from a, from a book in the 1920s, that essentially if people define situations as real, they're real in their consequences. 
you know, if you act as if something, if you define something as if, you know, you believe this to be the truth, you often act in accordance with that model. And in a sense, that can kind of create that as the truth. You know, if everyone acts as if something's true, in some ways, the consequences are the same as if it, as if it, weren't, um, as if it were true or real. So in terms of rethink, which is the kind of theme of this, of this, this TEDx event today, I guess, I suppose I'm interested in this talk in, in kind of giving you an idea of some ways of like tools to help us rethink. You know, are there ways that can help us rethink differently? And imaginaries are one of those, are one of those kind of tools or parts of it. Because often when we think about it, these kind of big ideas or how we might explain them, we, you know, looking at things like the narratives we use or the stories we tell ourselves or the ways we explain kind of cause and effect in, in, in particular ways. Um, the, um, you know, and the metaphors that we use, and we'll come back to that in a minute, uh, you know, can be very important, but also the kind of myths and folk theories that we might have as a, as a society for explaining things. Now, it might be that, you know, and, and in general, these are kind of complicated, abstract things that we, that we develop these for. They're things that we can't easily point to, but we know they exist, but actually they're quite, you know, they're potentially quite complex or abstract. And, you know, in a technology sense, it's often things like, AI or you know, automation or algorithmic decision making or your own personal data privacy, particularly in relation to kind of social media and Facebook and what people might do with that, and like the internet in general. We all have imaginaries of these and they affect, they affect the way that decisions are made. They affect the way that you personally do things, but they also affect the way that, for example, policy is made. You know, how does government approach this? How does, you know, how, what gets funded? What things are ignored? What, who's included and who isn't? Um, but we should probably think more broadly than that as well. You know, what are our imaginaries of like health, or you know, particularly climate change, or resources in the world, or you know, social equity, the law, the government, you know, the economies. There's been quite a lot of research on people's imaginaries of different sorts of economy. How do they think they work? How do people, you know, and how does that affect what people do? And in general, kind of quality of life. So. Why, why am I interested in this? So I came at this as a designer, right? I was a, I was a product designer. I used to design things like, work on things like folding bikes and kind of motors for driving wheelchairs and, the, and these kind of things. But as a, as a designer, I became more interested, I guess, in the wider scope of things, like the power that design has actually to affect the way people do things in society, the effect, how, how it affects the way we live our lives. That wasn't always necessarily acknowledged. Like, all of these things have consequences, whatever's designed. So, um, so I went back and, and, and became a researcher. Um, I went to, to um, here Brunel University in London, um, which is as di um, dystopian as it looks. No, it's not really. But, it, um, but uh, this was the sort of this was the sort of idea that inspired me. And I didn't find this quote until later. But it's this idea that, in a sense, this is from Anne Marie Willis, who's a design researcher um, or design academic. The idea that, that we design our world while our world acts back on us and designs us. And she's kind of paraphrasing quite a famous quote by Winston Churchill there about architecture. But it's, it's the, the idea that, like, you know, we design things, but actually the stuff that is designed ends up designing our lives to some extent. And we may not always realize the, the ways in which that does it. So, you know, something very basic, like, like people queuing there, people lining up, like, you know, they don't have to. There are social effects, there are social norms around it, but to some extent, the simple design of just, you know, that kind of rope thing, which doesn't actually prevent you climbing through it, but there's enough, it's wrapped up in the norms that we, that we experience. I mean, it's a, it's a silly example, it's a trivial thing, but I mean, even the way, you know, you came and sat and faced the front, not many of you moved the chairs around. There is, there's a kind of, you know, what's like design in everyday life that, that affects the way we do things. Now, this area of design, or this sort of approach, is sometimes called behavioral design, or design for behavior change. In the last, and in the last few years, it's become quite a big, quite a big kind of popular topic. Um, but when I was doing research on this, um, you know, it, it's, it's sort of, it, it's, I mean, I guess it's become popular through the kind of things like fitness tracking and, um, you know, things to try to get you to slow down or, um, you know, when, when you're driving or... Um, you know, things that try to get us to save energy or use less energy. Um, you know, even here in, you know, right outside in, in, in the street here in Oakland, like, you know, you get a green wave of traffic lights if you drive below the speed limit, right? So there are these kind of behavioral design examples in everyday life. Um, but there's also things like, um, you know, even that, right? Bro bits of broken glass in, in the, um, you know, in the top of a wall is a kind of behavioral design example, right? It's, an, it's to try to get you not to climb over the wall. So it's a big field, and when I was doing research on that, I suppose I realized that it's, it's almost like the intersection of lots of these other areas with design. So different areas of psychology, sociology, um, 
you know, a lot of kind of behavioral economics and decision science and so on, all intersecting with, with design. So it's a very interdisciplinary way of looking at things, which is not always easy. But so what I did in terms of research with this is I, is I brought together groups of designers from different backgrounds um, and different expertise to try to almost involve them in thinking about how do they think about people's behavior? Like, how does that enter into their work as, as, as designers? And we ended, up, um, we ended up producing this design with intent toolkit, which is basically a card deck of ways that people's behavior is influenced through design or people's actions. Um, it's free to download if, 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 you know, if you're interested, but it kind of brings together lots of ideas in, in one place. And it's been used by quite a lot of people. Um, there have been different translations in different, you know, in, in different countries. Companies have used it for their own purposes and adapted it. But you can use it either to design something or you can use it as a way of critiquing the ways in which our own behavior is perhaps manipulated by design and in everyday life. You, know, you can kind of see it and use it in either way. Um, but in terms of applying this, what I ended up doing was a lot of the projects where it, where it was applied were around things like energy use and sustainability. We're actually changing people's behavior or trying to influence it. You know, it's a big topic. You know, can we get people to use less energy? Can we get people to act in a more sustainable way? And so I worked on a series of projects with things like the, the British government, um, and a European, um, a European project with a series of um, houses across Europe, um, where we were trying to investigate these different angles on this, like people's behavior and energy use and how the design of the technology affects it. Um, and one of the, the ways we did this really often involved going and spending time with people in the context in which they were using energy. So we went and visited people at home, in people's offices, we'd spend time with them and say, you know, show me how you use this. Let, take me through the steps of you, I don't know, using the heating system or cooking something. Um, and, you know, and also looking at the ways they got information. How do they make decisions about energy use? How do they kind of, you know, how, does, how do they think about energy, frankly? And often, you know, it was looking at the kind of devices they had available to understand it, whether it's, you know, some kind of metering app or like monitoring system you know, the sorts of meters that are available, the sorts of monitors and displays that are available, um, which are mostly gray LCD screens. They're not all of them, but quite a lot of them. Um, so we did things like get people to take us through their days, you know, and explain how they're using energy in different, in different ways at different times um, and for what sort of activities and talk us through their thought process that they did it. And one of the things that, became, that came out from this is that actually people's mental models and their sort of mental imagery of this, of this thing are actually really important in how they make decisions about it because no one is trying to use energy at all. They're trying to do something else. They're trying to keep the house clean or you know, um, make the house comfortable or make a meal or keep their family happy or you know, wash their clothes so they, you know, because that's what we do in society. <laughs> you know, they're trying to comply with something. They're not trying to use energy at all, right? Um, and so we, this, there's this idea that like, energy's invisibility is actually really important in this. And it's a key issue in people's understanding is that this thing is invisible, and so it's difficult to understand it. And so you can only really understand it through other things, through numbers in lots of ways. So one of the things we did, which started out as an icebreaker exercise, in fact, but actually became quite a big bit of research in itself, was to ask people, actually, OK, draw for us, what do you think energy looks like? Right? It's, a, it's an abstract thing, but you know, what, what comes to mind? And so we got, in this particular example here, we got, we got about 100 people at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London to, to draw for us what they think energy looks like. Um, and there's, you know, obviously there's no right or wrong answer. There are different representations, but there's, there isn't a right way to look at it because it's an abstract concept. But we started to see that the sort of metaphors that people used um, were actually quite important to their understanding of, of it. And that maybe is obvious in, in general, but it's an, interesting, it's an interesting way of thinking. So some of the things people came up with, you know, this person visualized energy as kind of rays coming out of someone's face. Um, for someone else, it's more, you know, it's the nu uh, nuclear fusion equation in the sun. Um, someone else, it's kind of, you know, it's something they come and go somewhere. It perhaps goes on forever, but it's got a kind of um, chaos to it, perhaps. For some people, it was more like a kind of personal thing, or maybe it was like an aura. Um, um, there are various other types of chaos, fire kind of chaos, vortex type chaos. Um, sort of lightning type approaches um, and other types of kind of, you know, sun type, um, sun type energy. So, I mean, there's a whole selection of these. And actually, we put them together in, with some analysis in a, in a book that's a free download if you're interested that's kind of tries to analyze some of these and almost see like what the implications might be for people designing stuff around it, interfaces or ways of explaining 
things. But in general, like, you know, there are other ways of, of, of understanding energy. So we started to try to, to, to look at some of these and to try to explore them in different ways because, because often, you know, you see it in terms of numbers on a, on a meter or on a bill. Um, but what if you could do something like, what if you could hear it, for example? And this was something that was suggested by one of the householders we worked with. You know, why can't I hear how much energy, how much electricity is being used by things? So this project, PowerCord, was a kind of sonified um, home energy monitor that, that Leon monitored different appliances and, um, and turned it, in this case, and you'll hear this, this prototype now, um, actually used, um, used birdsong. Anyway, so I mean, it's not as particularly pleasant in the way you're hearing it there. But the idea is, you know, it might be, a, you know, is that a useful metaphor? Maybe it's not, but it's an interesting other way of getting an, another way of understanding what's going on. Um, so what we've done with that is we've taken that project further, and it should be installed in May in uh, at, at Carnegie Mellon in um, that building, Margaret Morrison Carnegie Hall. Um, you should be able to walk through the building and hear. It won't be birdsong. Well, it won't be like that. It'll be nicer than that. Um, whatever the sound it is. Um, you'll be able to hear the electricity that's being used by the building in real time, basically, or, or a summary of what's happened over the past few days. Um, and actually, you know, whether that changes people un people's understanding, I don't know, but that's part of what we're trying to find out. Does it lead to a different kind of awareness of the patterns? Um, this is something we've been working on as well with this, is, is actually um, almost like making vibrations from it in a way that could oh. be tangible, could be something that we use light reflected off of something like that, um, like a, um, a, a chladni figure, as it's, as it's sometimes called, or, or cymatics. Um, so lots of different, different things. And I, just, I guess just to finish, I just wanted to show you a couple of other, um, other approaches that are not to do with energy. So things like the mental landscapes idea was, was you know, can you almost like get people to extract ideas they have in their head and use landscape metaphors like hills and valleys and um, rocky patches, bridges, weather, and so on, as a way of kind of, um, as a way of, of like almost externalizing how you think about something. So the students here were visualizing their like um, sort of career path as, in this case, a sort of river with like they're on a boat heading towards some rapids and they've got to make a decision about where to go. Um, so the um, so there's so, you know you can use these kind of methods as ways of almost like externalizing your imaginaries. Um, and we've got this a final thing. We have this project, Civic Visions, which is in Pittsburgh, which is looking at how do people visualize or imagine local government and how might they imagine it differently. And the, uh, the, the thing coming next from that project is basically um, this thing where you'll be able to talk to fire hydrants and about how you imagine the future of Pittsburgh and how you, the future of engagement, if you like, with, um, with, with the city through talking to fire hydrants, which will listen to you. You're not just talking to them in the abstract. So, okay, so just to finish, um, there's this... Um, the, the, another com project coming is this idea around new metaphors, which is sort of about creating new metaphors for things that are difficult to explain. And so if you're interested in that, there's a, um, there's a free download of a kind of toolkit at newmetaphors.com that has, that has some of these things brought together. Um, so, yeah, to, to summarize, so these are all kind of tools to help us rethink. I mean, that's, that's, the, point, that's the point of these. And I think, you know, my question would be, could new imaginaries help us kind of change the behavior of the systems we're in, rather than our behavior being changed by design? Maybe we can help change the behavior of the systems that we're in. So, yeah, I'm using design to understand how people understand and helping people understand in new ways um, and helping people imagine new ways of living. So, yeah, I'd, I'd ask you, what are your imaginaries? Like, think about them. Think about when you... Think about when you notice them, when you, didn't, when you don't notice them, and maybe kind of think about are they, you know, what effects do they have on your, on your actions. Thank you.